We are in the middle of Torah Tetvav in the Kutim Maharan, Torah 15, called Ora Ganuz. And we are up to Ot Hei, part five in this Torah. And so in this Torah, Rabbi Nachman is explaining to us the formula of how we may merit to experience the taste of the essence of light, the hidden light, the first light, the primordial light of creation. Uh, of the beginning of creation. It's a light which is the essence. It's the, the, the source of kindness, the source of giving, the source of love. Because as we know, Kabbalistically, the spherot on the right side, the 10 spherot are split into three categories, uh, three kavim, three columns, we call them. And the, the column on the right are the spherot of kindness, and they're the spherot of revelation, and they're the spherot of love, and they're the spherot of giving. And the, this right side column of the spherot start, begins with chokma, and then it continues with chesed, and it continues with netzach. So Chachma, wisdom, is this aspect of light. It's the essence of light. It's the source of life. And that's why when you give, this, when you give to someone, right, giving to someone from a place, from an energy of love, is just an application, a practical application of the life energy. And that's why you feel more alive when you give to other people uh, selflessly. Um, that love energy is the energy of life. And so the source of that is this light that we're speaking about, the essence of life. It's the essence of light, and it is called the Ora Ganuz. Where is it hidden? Where is it Ganuz? Where is it hidden? Hashem hid it in the Torah because it's the essence of the Torah. It's the source of the Torah. It's, the, the, it's even higher and before with the secrets of the Torah. So the secrets of the Torah are as close as we have today to this aspect called the Ora Ganuz, the hidden light. But there are hidden secrets, there are secrets of the Torah that even today are not revealed yet to us. They will be revealed in the next world. And they, were re and they will be revealed when we have dissolved all of the limitations of this world. In this physical world, in this stage of the universe, we have certain physical limitations that don't allow us to experience fully the essence of life. They don't allow us to experience fully the source of love, love in its most expanded state, in the greatest state. They don't allow us to experience fully the essence of light and revelation, revelation of Hashem, the essence of the truth of the universe, which is the oneness of the Rebbe Shalom, in, in, its, in its completely experience, in the complete experience of that. But when we dissolve those limitations, and that's in the next stage of the universe, the next state of the world, so then we will be able to receive that light. We will no longer be confined and limited to this physical perception. A person's perception and a person's experience in their reality is only is limited to their kalim, to the tools that they have, to what they are able to experience. If something is beyond what you're able to experience, if a person lived their life constantly from a certain perspective, Right, so that perspective is kind of like a glasses. It's kind of like a box that they're looking at the whole world through, and they can't see anything else, uh, anything that it doesn't fit that box that they're looking through to the whole world. But when you dissolve that limitation, when you break off that 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 box, when you break that box, and when you take off those glasses, and now you can see fully what is the essence of what is. Then now you have tremendously expanded your perception to perceive much more. And that's what it means that you need to dissolve the limitations of the physical self. And so Rabbi Nachman in this, story is in this Torah is ex explaining to us the formula of how we may merit to experience the taste of the essence of light, life, and love already now. We don't have to wait for the next stage of the world, the next stage of the universe in order to receive these secrets of the Torah. And how do we do that? So obviously, if the reason why we're going to merit these secrets of the Torah, which is the essence of life, essence of light, the essence of love, only in the next stage of the universe, the reason for that is, as we explained, because then we are going to no longer have those limitations of the physical self, the, the limitations that limit our perception and our ability to perceive this great light, 
are going to dissolve. We're no longer going to be confined to that. That's why we will merit that those that light in the next stage of the world in the Olam Abba, in the Atid level. So this says Rabbi Nachman, if you have a way, if you find a way of doing that already now, if you have a way of releasing those limitations, those confines of the physical self already now, and we spoke about how that's an aspect of Shabbat, right? Shabbat is 160th of Olam Haba. And, and, and so if you can do that, release that already now, then that's the formula, that's the way, that's the path, and that's the process you have to take in order to merit experiencing the sweetness, uh, the tasting of these secrets of the Torah, of this essence of light and life already now. And so Rabbi Nachman explained to us a simple formula. How do you do that? He said that you have to return um, the yira, the energy of fear to its source, to Hashem, and that's the aspect of malchut. Um, and you have to return it to Hashem. You have to return it to the source of the fear energy. Where is the source of the fear energy? Meaning, what does it mean, the source of the fear energy? Meaning, where is the state that fear energy needs to be in, in order for it to be in its source? What does that mean? At home. In order for it to be in its most perfective, in, in its, its most perfected uh, version. Okay, the best version of it. When, where is that? So Rabbi Nachman explained uh, the, the source of the fear energy is the dot, is the knowing, meaning that you have to come to a deep knowing, uh, 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 a consciousness and an awareness of who I need to be in awe of. So it's no longer a disconnected fear of something in the outside reality, in the outside world. Now it's experienced as an awe of the Ribbon Shalom because through my con my meditation and my contemplation, my Hidbonanut, I have come to recognize who I need to really feel awe from. And so by recognizing the greatness of Hashem, the greatness of Hashem's splendor and us and how awesome Hashem is, then I come to feel that awe of the Ribbon Shalom. So that's the knowing, that's the that. But Rabbi Nachman explains that the dot also, it's not just an intellectual knowing, it has to be a knowing that is felt, a felt recognition. And so that felt dot, that felt recognition, it's, it's, that is not intellectual, something that you're actually experiencing, that means that this dot also has a source. It also has a state where it is in its complete, complete perfected uh, uh, version. Where is that? That's the heart. And so that means that this knowing has to be a knowing that you are experiencing, not a knowing that you just know of intellectually. It's a knowing, a deep knowing that you experience it, and that's in the heart. And so the yira, you bring it up, the fear energy, you bring it up, so it's awe of the Rebona Shalom, because now you know who you should be in awe of, and that you bring to the heart. And where, how, do you, how do you accomplish this? How do you accomplish bringing the yira, the fear energy, back to the consciousness to the awareness to the expanded awareness and from there making sure that that awareness is an experienced awareness it's an awareness in the heart not just an intellectual awareness rabbi nachman says through the he gave us a practical exercise of a compassionate uh, self-assessment where a person judges themselves compassionately um, and when a person judges themselves compassionately a person merits to bring the fear or the, the power and the significance and that a person was giving to all of these things in the outside world, he's bringing it back to Hashem. And now he's giving power, significance, importance, honor, and fear or awe of Hashem. So that's returning the fear to, to the Rebbe Hashem, to its source. And we explain what does it mean, uh, compassionate self-assessment? A compassionate judgment, we explained it a couple different ways, two different ways. We explained that it, it's, about, uh, it's, about, it's about judging yourself from, with, with love. It's about standing up for yourself. It's about finding uh, the reasons uh, how you're not that terrible and you're not that bad, if, despite recognizing your faults, despite recognizing the places where there is potential for improvement, you see it from 
from a state of compassion towards yourself, from a state of loving yourself, from a state of recognizing all the many, many uh, aspects within yourself that you've grown so far, right? All the reasons why you are, you are doing well and you have a lot to appreciate and you have a lot, a lot to love about yourself. And you're looking at yourself from a growth mindset, meaning that it's not either, either I'm good or I'm bad. It's all about life is a growing process. And we incrementally increase the, the quality of, of our life. We incrementally improve, right? Every day, a little better and a little bit better by appreciating what, where we've come from and how much we have accomplished so far. And, and, and it's not just an Asi Tov, it's not just the positive that we've accomplished that now, let's say for today, I learned an extra, an, an, extra, an extra hour of learning Torah or a couple extra minutes of learning Torah. It's also all those places where, where you no longer have negatives, right? So let's say the fact that, let's say a person that day did not succumb to a certain negative character trait as many times as he does usually, right? That already, that itself is also something to appreciate. And that comes from a compassionate uh, judgment, a compassionate self-assessment. So that's one aspect that we spoke about, compassionately from a state of being compassionate to yourself, loving yourself, recognizing the good in yourself. You're inherently good, okay? And even though I see that there is room for improvement, I am seeing it from the eyes of compassion. The second aspect we spoke about in the self in the self assessment, the compassionate judgment is looking at it from the eyes even if you're seeing the negative, you're looking at it from the eyes from the perspective of your higher self, meaning that that even the places that could be improved in my life, right? The aspects that have potential, I have potential, I need to fix all these different things in my life but you're not seeing those faults or those negative character traits as who you are. You're not identifying with them. You just recognize from the higher self, the self that is beyond the physical self, right? The soul, the essence, the neshama that is perfect already now and already here. It's not lacking anything. We're speaking about the source of the neshama, okay? And that place is perfect already now and already here. And from that perspective, I see all of these things that have room for improvement. And so by not identifying with it, I it naturally awakens within me feelings of compassion, just like a mother to her children, okay? That have, uh, even though they were told not to, they went and they played in the mud and now they come home and they're crying and they're all dirty and they're all filthy and the mother takes them in her arms, even though she's getting dirty and she wipes them off and she cleans them off and she puts them in the bath and she takes care of them, right? So that's the natural feeling that comes from looking at yourself, assessing and judging yourself from the perspective of the higher self. Now, now in this year, I want to also add another point. And that is that when a person counts all of the points within themselves, when you count all the points within yourself that you have not only room for improvement, room to fix in your life, but by also paying attention and looking at all the points within yourself that you have success, that you have success in. So just by counting them, just by counting them, that itself by counting and looking all the days that I've come, all the days in the past and all the days that, and all the successes from the past days and from the past weeks, that I've kept up with, that itself should naturally awaken within the person the, the, the compassionate uh, state that we're speaking about. And so what's the point here? That's, how is this different than what I said before? It's just an added idea that a person should count their wins. And, and in, a certain, in, in, a, in a day and in a week, if a person counts their wins and almost sees it like, uh, uh, makes it like a fun game where a person doesn't get, a person doesn't fall into the ego of the fact that I'm successful or not has anything to do with, with whether I'm worthy or not, right? And when a person doesn't see it as, uh, as their successes or their failures having to do whether they're worthy or not, they make it more like a game. They make it more easy then a person uh, 
that itself, that perspective itself, uh, allows a person to uh, to grow and to recognize what needs improvement without falling into the opposite of self-compassion. And so that's the point here. The point here is that by avoiding the neg the negative, the opposite of self-compassion, which is what which is judgment from a place of guilt and shame and being hard on yourself. Instead, recognizing the, the parts, the places for improvement, and at the same time, recognizing your improvements that you have, what you have improved in a light way, you know, just like my recognize, almost like as if it's a game and you're counting your wins and you're counting the, how every day you make an X on the calendar or a check on the calendar um, in all of these different things that you're working on. That itself is considered, that's called a compassionate judgment. Um, in, in, I know that Nahar Shalom, in the Yeshiva Mikubal Nahar Shalom, in our Yeshiva, there is a Rabbi Nayao Shmueli, the Rosh Yeshiva, gives out on every Elul, he gives out these, uh, these lists. It's like a paper that he prepared many, many, many years ago. You can tell because you can see how many times it's been photocopied. And, um, and it's been many years that I'm in the yeshiva and every year he gives it up in, in Elul. And it's basically a checklist. And it's a checklist going through all of the, all of the, the main categories and the subcategories of what, uh, what good Avodah Hashem is all about, learning, davening, midot, bin adam lamakum, between you and Hashem, the mitzvot, uh, in your relationship between you and Hashem, your relationship between you and people, other people, kindness, tzedakah, uh, going to sleep by a certain time, kriyat shema, brachot, uh, not doing, uh, you know, shmir denayim, holiness, all of these different aspects, and it's two sides. So he goes really, he has the big categories, and then in each big category, there are all the subcategories. And then, and then there's like on the side of all that, there's just little boxes, and you make a check. And for every day, there's one page like this. So they give stacks and stacks of them. So for every Elul, you can, people that want to do it just for Elul, they, you know, they take 30 pages and every day before they go to bed and they just go through the list, making a check or an X. Okay, so by, by removing yourself from the emotions and the feelings of, of guilt and shame that maybe that person may fall, and instead just making it almost like a game that itself is uh that itself is the way the higher self would look at it okay so the second aspect of the judgment uh compassionate judgment that we spoke about seeing it from the perspective of the higher self this is one of the ways that the higher self would look at it is not identifying with those uh, malot or chesronot uh, and just seeing it from a higher self and that itself is a compassionate way of doing it uh, so these are a couple of ways of of practicing applying the this advice of Rabbi Nachman. And Rabbi Nachman says that when you do this, you are returning the fear to the place of awe that is experienced out of a recognition of how great the Ribbon of Shalom is and experienced in the heart. And then Rabbi Nachman says that that Rabbi Nachman said from here. From this dot that you merited, when you merit this dot, this knowing, this expanded consciousness, then you merit Torah. And he says that in Torah, there are two aspects. There's the aspect of the revealed part of the Torah, and there's the aspect of the hidden part of the Torah. So first you want to merit and you want to develop your, uh, your, your, your success in the revealed part of the Torah. Because Rabbi Nachman says that that's the aspect of Sinai. And when you develop your, your learning in the revealed part of the Torah, which, which is a part of the Torah of many, many, many details, as we spoke about in the previous year, and all of these details are impossible to remember and to retain and to contain all of that in your heart, which is called Sinai, right? That's metaphorically the heart of Sinai that the whole Torah was given through. It's impossible to do that unless unless you release, you release the ego. And when you release the ego and you recognize that the Torah is the word of Hashem and you recognize the soul of the Torah, then that approach to learning this, the revealed part of the Torah, all the halachot of the Torah will, will give you that success that you need to 
contain all of these many, many, many details. Okay, because when you see the soul of all the details and you approach all of these details from that inner spiritual perspective, that it's the word of Hashem, that's the consciousness of the Rebbe Shalom, that's the light of, 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 of the life that Hashem has given us, that perspective will allow you to contain all of these details of the halachot, and that's the Sinai. And that will bring you, Rabbi Nachman says, that will bring you to davening to Hashem, speaking to Hashem, praying to Hashem, from selflessness, from self-sacrifice, from a place of mesirut nefesh, from a place of no ego. And when you do that, you develop a relationship with Hashem on a higher level. You re- develop a relationship with Hashem that is uh, a, self, a selfless relationship, uh, that now there are the, 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 the confines of, and limitations of the physical self are no longer here. And that will lead you to the re- secrets, the secrets of the Torah, the next part of the Torah, the, the secrets of the Torah, which is where the essence of light, the Oraganus, the hidden light, uh, dwells. Okay, and so that's in short the formula that Rabbi Nachman gives us in this Torah. Now Rabbi Nachman wants to fit it in, this formula, he wants to fit it into the story of Rabbi Babarchana that we already had in Likud Timuran, Torah Gimel. Okay, and so he brings this story of Rabbi Babarchana again, and now he's going to explain this story based on this Torah. So mm-hmm. let's read inside. Othe, he brings a story from the Gemara in uh, Baba Batra, Daf Ayin Gimel Amud Bet. Rabbi Babarchana. And this is what Rabbi Babachana recounted, the story that he recounted, that that I myself saw this akrukta, okay? Akrukta is a frog that was as, it was like the size of the city of Hagronia. The akra de Hagronia kamahave, how big, so he wants to explain to us how great and how big this frog that he saw. So the frog that he saw was as big as the city of Hagronia. But the city of Hagronia, how big was that? It, was, it had 60 houses. It was a city of 60 houses. So that means that this frog was as big as a city of 60 houses, which is quite big. Ata tanina bila'a. And then there was a tanina, which is a serpent, that came and swallowed this, this humongous frog. So imagine how, how huge the serpent was. And then, wait, it gets better than that. There's more. And then came this Pushkansa, which is a raven, and it swallowed the serpent. Oh, so imagine how big the raven was. Oh, but wait, there's more. And then the raven goes, The raven goes and sits uh, on the tree. It, it flew up to the tree and it sat on the tree. So imagine how big this tree was or how big the branch was. Come and see how great was the strength of that tree. So the whole story is bringing us to the point of the tree. Oh, how great and how big this tree was. Rav Papa Bar Shmuel, Rav Papa the son of Shmuel said, Had I not been there, I would not have believed him. Okay, so apparently he knows exactly what Rabbi Babarachana is alluding to in this story. He knows exactly this aspect, this secret that Rabbi Babarachana is speaking about. And he says that if I weren't there, I wouldn't have believed him. That means that's how astounding it is, what he, whatever he is speaking about, wherever this tree is and wherever this branch is and this whole story happened. He says, if I weren't there, I wouldn't have believed him. But he was there, and so he does believe him. Okay, so let's see what the Rashbam, how he explains his, uh, the story. Akrukta is a tzfardea. Akrukta is a frog in Aramaic. Ke'akra de Hagronia, like the city of Hagronia, gadol haya ke'oto krach. It was as large as that city called Hagronia. Ve'akra de Hagronia kamahavi shitim And the city of Hagronia, how big was it? It was 60 houses. Talmud ka'amala. This is the narration of the Gemara says uh, the Rajbam. These are not the words of Rabbi Barchana. The, Rabbi, the, the Gemara is narrating and explaining, oh, by the way, he said that it was as big as the, uh, the city of Hagrona. You know how big that city is? The Gemara tells us it was 60 houses. Atatanina, and then the serpent came to and ate the frog. 
So who is saying this? Is it the Gemara that's speaking, or is it Rabbah Babarchana? So he says this is back now, we're back to Rabbah Babarchana that's saying the, this part. That the serpent came and ate a frog. Rabbah Kamala. Rabbah told us this part. Pushkansa, Oriv Nekeva, it's a female raven. It's called a Pushkansa in Aramaic. Be'ilana, on the tree. Al anaf echad alfot on one of the branches of the tree. It doesn't mean on the whole tree. It means on one of the branches, just like what trees do. That's what they do. They go and they fly up to the tree, or they fly down, right? Depending on where they're coming from, and they they sit on the branch. La lo I would not have believed him. Okay. Now Rabbi Nachman is going to explain to us how these parts of the story they re represent represent the different aspects in this Torah. So the the akruk that we said is the tzfardea, it's the frog. So Rabbi Nachman says that the frog, the symbol of the frog, what does that symbolize in this story? It symbolizes, it represents lifting up and elevating the fear energy and bringing it back to its source, which is knowing, which is dat, consciousness, awareness. Why? How do you get to there? From frog, how? So he explains that the frog is called Tzfardea. And Tzfardea is made up really of two parts. Okay, Tzipor Dea. Tzipor Dea, as we see that Eliyahu Navi in Tanat Ve'eliyahu, also in the Kavanot of the Haggadah, we see that Tzfardea is split into two parts, two words. Tzipor Dea. Tzipor means the bird, Dea of consciousness. Okay, so Tzipor says Rabbi Nachman, represents yira the bird represents symbolizes the fear energy because yira as we've been explaining here in this torah is malchut and malchut is also called uh the kingship of hashem that aspect that energy that sphere is also called eretz the land as we saw eretz yarea vishakata right the land was filled with fear and it was silent. It was silent in that fear, right? So Eretz is this aspect of um, Malchut, and it's the aspect of fear. And so, how do, so now Rabbi Nachman is going is connecting to us that bird Sipor is the aspect of Eretz. It's the aspect of of the land, which is the aspect of Malchut, which is the aspect of fear. So you see how he he gets there since. Fear is the aspect of Malchut, which is the aspect of Eretz, the, the land. And the bird is the aspect of the land. So now we have combined them, and the bird is the aspect of fear. It's the aspect of Hira. How do we know that the land, Eretz, is the aspect of the bird? Where do you get that connection from? So Rabbi Nachman gives us a pasuk in Yeshayahu. The pasuk says, Mikinaf Eretz Zemirot Shamanu. From the corner of the earth, we heard songs. So Rabbi Nachman makes a drasha that, again, Rabbi Nachman doesn't even speak out the drasha, but he is, uh, he is assuming that we will pick up on the drasha, okay? That when it says from the corner of the earth, we heard songs, what word does it use for the corner of the earth? Mikinaf. Mikinaf. The word knaf means a corner, right? Arba kanfot, the four corners of the garment, when we put the tzitzit. But it also means a wing. Knaf is also another word for a wing. And so you could read it, the Pasuk in Yeshayahu, that from the wings of the earth we heard songs. From the wings of Eretz. Eretz, we said the earth, the land is Malchut. And the wings of Malchut, from the wings of Malchut, we heard songs. So we see this aspect of a bird that has wings, that gives song, a bird, that's what it does, it chirps songs, 
as we see in the Zohar, the Zohar refers to the bird as the one that, that sings in reference to the Mitzorah and the, 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 the sacrifice that the Mitzorah has to bring is the two birds because he, he spoke and he, and he used his mouth and he used his voice in improper ways when he spoke, um, when he spoke ill of other people. So that's why he has to bring the two birds as his sacrifice, right? But that's in the Zohar. So we see from this Pasuk that this bird, this bird from the wings of the earth, we heard songs. We see this bird is the aspect of the earth, of the land, of the Malchut. It has wings and it sings. And then he brings another proof and he says, The Pasuk says, who are these that fly as a cloud? Who are these that fly as a cloud? It says in the Pasuk. Mi ele ka'av te'ufena. So Rabbi Nachman again is just assuming that you'll pick up on the drasha. He doesn't even explain it. He doesn't even uh, verbalize it. But what's, what, how do we see it from this Pasuk? Mi ele, Rabbi Nachman says, look, the words mi and ele are the two parts of the name Elohim. Okay? And there are many, many, many kavanot that we see in the Arizal and the Maharal and many tzaddikim throughout the generation that make drashot on how Elohim is made up of mi and ele. But mi ele is Elohim. Elohim we know. Right? Anyone who's learned a drop of Kabbalah knows that Elohim is another name referring to the Malchut. Okay? And it's referring to the fear aspect, the fear uh, energy, the yira, the, the, the din of the malchut. Dina de malchuta dina, right? As we see in the Gemara. The judgment of the, of the kingdom, the judgment of the king. Dina de malchuta. That's Elohim. Mi ele is the word, letters Elohim. Ka'av ufena, like that fly as a cloud. So there is the reference the connection between those that fly as a cloud, which is the bird. We're not speaking about clouds. Otherwise, they don't fly like cloud. A cloud doesn't fly like a cloud. A, a cloud is a cloud, right? So obviously it flies. But what flies like a cloud is the bird. And the birds are all those creatures that fly in the skies, like the clouds. And that is connected to the mi'ele. That's connected to the aspect of Elohim, which is the malchut. And so... Uh, Sipor, all of this is to prove to us Sipor, the aspect of bird is the aspect of Malchut, and the aspect of Malchut is the aspect of fear, the fear that we have to elevate. And where are we bringing it to? Where it's the source of the, of the fear, of the era, of the Malchut? And we said it's the expanded consciousness. It's the dot. And that's why Tzipor Dea, right, which is the two words that make up Tzipor Dea, Sipor, we said malchut or fear. Dea is the dat, is the consciousness, the awareness, the expand consciousness, represents elevating the fear energy, the yira, to its source, to the dat. And so we'll see the continuation of the, uh, Rabbi Nachman explaining the story in the next year, Israel.